Good morning. Welcome to Lenten Reflections. And Melvin, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. It's good to be here, Michelle. Pastor Kathy had this great idea, and she's right, that we have three retired clergy in our congregation, and wouldn't it be fun and interesting that we can hear from everybody so that we're able to really deepen our thoughts and reflections. So, Great idea. I'm just so glad you're here. Well, so um, it's Lent, and for our theme, Roll Down Justice, uh, we have this baptismal font, and we are going to begin by pouring in the waters of baptism. And we remember, too, in our sanctuary, how we have on the altars um, the, the water flowing over, reminding us that through our baptism that we are all part of this river of justice. And so we begin with this. And uh, this week, our theme is renouncing evil. Now, that's a fun one, isn't it? Oh, it's fun. <laughs> so I don't know if it just seems a little um, too big um, to think about renouncing evil, if we should break it down a little bit. But, you know, when um, people are baptized, that's part of our liturgy, too, that people will agree to renounce evil um, and to, um, to speak out against injustice and evil and whatever forms that and resist evil in whatever forms they present themselves. What do you think of um, a good definition for evil? Because I think oh. we think that's kind of like out there, <laughs> right? Oh, some of us, for some of us, it's much more personal. We do plenty ourselves. Uh, and that's one of the amazing things about evil is it, it's kind of in stratified layers. There's the very personal, the evil I do, um, when I lose my temper with my spouse, mm. uh, the evil that we as a congregation do when we um, build buildings that aren't accessible to people, mm. when we sing songs that aren't, under, aren't understood by people, we use a language that even, even modern Americans don't speak the King's English, and yet some of us insist on the King James Version. And then it, it builds all the way up to the global level. Um, the world is at war. The injustices we have come from the fact that you and I are privileged and mm -hmm. steal resources and labor from weaker parts of the country. And so it, it, evil exists. To me, evil is the opposite of love. Love mm. is... Love is desiring the best for the other person. And evil is not desiring the best for the other person. I really like that. That really breaks it down, I think, in a way that we're, a form that we're able to, to think about it um, in a way that, um, because I think normally when we're thinking about something that's so big, we, we're in, we insulate ourselves from it because we, we don't think about how we're part of, of this, like systemic racism. There's ways that we are actively engaged with that, that unless we break it apart, we, we don't realize how we are. And, and you know, I think that the other part of, of evil um, in, um, is we're, we're thinking about how, how um, ways that maybe we participate in evil or we allow evil to happen and we're not actively speaking up against it um, is, is in part that um, we, we tend to think that we're all or not, right? Um, we're either evil or we're not evil and we forget about um, the fact that it's nuanced. It's a spectrum and there are, are times and places where we are all about love and there's times and places where what we are doing is the opposite of love and is harmful to others. And it, it's and the danger of thinking about evil in that huge picture thing is it seems overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so we turn off the news and turn on Gilligan's Island, um, if I can show my age. Um, because 
the solution requires knowledge. Right. Or, or the solution also requires power. And we can feel really powerless when we are confronted with a problem that is harmful to people, but it's so great and we just don't have the authority. You know, it's it, it, it can feel like um, <laughs> this shows privilege too. If we um, go into a store and there's a problem with an item that we purchased and we're telling the person, you know, the cashier, and we're asking them to come up with a solution, well, they may not be the person that has the authority to solve our problem. But, um, you know, and then we get really upset and they get really upset and a little bit more evil happens, right? You know, because it's not, not a loving situation. And, um, and so, so, you know, I think that that is true too. So we go and we watch Gilligan's Island or whatever it is that um, helps us to move um, our thoughts away from that issue to something else. And because knowledge is power, and power is what creates the injustices and oppressions in our world, mm -hmm. we have to work at the knowledge end of things. We don't know that we exclude people by building churches with lots of steps, and that excludes people. We don't know that not changing our language and our music to meet the needs of a particular new generation mm -hmm. excludes people. We don't know that buying at the store that sells um, products that are produced oppressively mm -hmm. um, is creating the need for immigration, which creates the homelessness, which creates that. And so until, right. we, until we, we study and learn and understand how that all works, we can't renounce evil and oppression. Well, do you know, and I like what you're saying right here too, because one mm. thing that we can do is we can become curious. And, um, oh, so we have these <laughs> slips, and, um, and um, I want to share mine first. Um, and and we, I, the thing that I asked people who were in person in worship this Sunday is to um, write down an injustice for which you feel particularly angered. And what I asked people to do was to put it into the baptismal water. Now, um, there were a lot of slips, so it was a little cloudy in there. But this, this dissolves into it. And the idea is that as this dissolves in, that our baptismal waters are just filled with many, many uh, different parts of us. And, and that is... Um, you know, all part of the river of justice. And that um, sometimes as we're, we are educating ourselves and asking, being curious and asking the whys, it helps us to learn ways that we are able to engage and to, to resist evil, to, to stand with people who are oppressed and to try and, and shift the system so that um, everyone is better able to enjoy God's shalom. And so, um, so what, what I wrote on, on my paper today, um, that what really is angering me right now, um, an injustice that's angering me, is the challenges that our asylum-seeking immigrant brothers and sisters are facing right now. And I'm thinking about Riverton Park, United Methodist Church, and in the news, we're hearing about all of the many asylum-seeking immigrants who are coming to that church because um, someone told them on the other side of the border that this is where they should go and that they would have a place of hospitality. And our sister, um, you know, Jan Bullerjack, is... <laughs> She is working so hard with her, um, you know, with her congregation to create that space. But for many who are there, it's camping out in tents and it is cold. And more and more are coming. And so one of the things I wondered, Melvin, was why is it that there are so many people in those camps? 
you know, why, why, um, for one, do we not have resourcing with our government for people who need housing? And why are they having to, to camp for months and months and months? And I bet you know the answer to that one. <laughs> I used to work with the, um, the detention center roundtable uh, and am very familiar with what some of the issues are. Um, the global injustice of wealth is mm-hmm. the big picture that's too big for any of us to handle by ourselves. Uh, it means that there are places in the world that because of war or because of poverty, it is not a survivable situation. Mm-hmm. And so people must leave their homelands. Mm-hmm. And the countries of the world basically agree that we all have some responsibility to make room for them. Mm-hmm. And the U.S. government wants to be a benevolent government. And so we say those who need uh, asylum can come to this country. And they can register and they can be legal uh, asylum seekers. Mm-hmm. But then it takes years for us to go through the court process to get them the right to have a job here, the so they're, right to do business here. So they are crossing the border. They're crossing here. But they they can't get a job because they don't have a green card. Right. And their court case may be five years away. A- absolutely. And in the meantime, they have the choice of starving to death working illegally under the table, which makes them very vulnerable because if anyone turns them in, they can be deported and never get their immigration status back. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just a myriad of problems for them. I'm gonna put this into the baptismal waters. And um, and as I'm doing that, and um, you're not able to see so well, but Melvin, you can see, and how it's dissolving in. And that, that anger, I think, is helpful for us because that then gives us the impetus to do something. And that's a big problem. You and I can't give people permission to work. That's a government piece. But you and I could write to um, our representative in Congress and we can write to our senators and we can we can highlight this issue and ask them to create some legislation that will allow a temporary uh, you know right to work once the they um, the immigrant comes legally into this country until their court hearing the last big reform that we had in immigration rights was under Reagan, and uh, he put in place a pathway towards citizenship that theoretically, in a, a timely fashion, gave people a, a way to normalize their lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need to reestablish that and, and mm-hmm. really perfect it. And to do that, we have to learn about it. That's right. We can't change the channel. We have to. That's right. Listen to the the reports about the detention center, the reports about the um, encampment at at the other church, and ask ourselves, um, what creates this? What can remedy this? And then we need to um, donate blankets so that the people Mm -hmm. who are there get warm. That's something we can do right now. Write our legislatures and say for-profit detention centers that make money off of a broken immigration system need to be abolished. Um, There are a lot of levels Mm -hmm. and we can't all solve all the problems. No, but but there's something we can do. Each of us can find some place along the way. There's something we can do. And right now um, we're collecting blankets um, through this week. But if you bring blankets in March, we'll take them to Riverton Park. We will make sure that, that they yeah. can have them. And that is that was something that that Pastor Jan was saying was really interesting because people were donating sleeping bags. And you might think sleeping bags would would be really the warmer option Perfect. Yeah. if people are having to sleep in tents outside. But she said that they really prefer the blankets and so I think that's one thing that that we absolutely can do 
And that underscores part of the reason that, that or part of the solution, and that is we have to be curious. Yes. We have to ask ourselves, why do they want blankets instead of this, instead of sleeping bags? Mm -hmm. And the reason is you can wear the blanket as a shawl to keep you warm when you aren't in bed. You can cut up the blanket and make a, a pair of pants out of it if you're desperate for a pair of pants to wear. Uh, there are a lot of ways mm -hmm. that blankets can get used that sleeping bags can't. But until we ask. educate ourselves... Yep, we, we don't ask. understand that. It's true. What did you put on your slip? <laughs> I like the big problem today. Um, theft from the power challenged peoples of the world for their minerals and labor Ooh. by the powerful peoples. Ooh. I have strong connections in Africa, and the, the developed world needs the minerals from Africa, and we pay dirt cheap amounts to get those minerals. We work children and adults in oftentimes slave labor situations wow. to mine those things. And I have a nice shirt that cost me maybe one or two hours worth of, of my income, but was made available to me by workers in the mines that are earning in a month what I've earned in, my, in an hour or a day, wow. you know? And it's mind boggling. We're cheating them for their labor. We're yeah. cheating them from their minerals. And it's and it's overwhelming. Yeah. And, you know, some of that, too, is the choices that we make as as we, we talked about where we shop. And um, I know that it's it's a tough economy for 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 many of us. And it's a tougher economy for those who aren't able to, in other places around the world, earn living wages and earn wages commensurate with the, the wealth that they're, they're bringing in too. And that means that part of our work in renouncing evil is to, to try and make careful choices as best as we can, as best as we can navigate. But again, being curious where did that shirt come from? And this is where I wrestle with my own evil. I like a good deal. I mm -hmm. like going to the store that buys immorally produced products. Yep. And paying tiny little amounts, oftentimes for things that I have no need or use for. Yep. Um, toys for the grandkids that already have more, more toys than they need. And I have to... I have to, in it, my baptismal vow of renouncing evil and injustice mm -hmm. means I have to think clearly about what I'm buying, why I'm buying it, uh, how responsible its, its production was so that I can buy less, buy better. Um, I think you should put that in the water. The so, I'd like up, to, I'd like to dissolve bit. that one in the world. I'd like, yeah. But when you look at a handful of people that control as much of the world's wealth and consequently power uh, as whole countries uh, control, it feels overwhelming. It is. But we do what we can, and and. And we're a community of faith. So when we're all working together, when we're all raising our voices, you know, one of the things I think about is if there's a protest of an issue that's really important happening in Seattle, I know you're you're probably there and you're marching. <laughs> I have been before. Yeah, because that's one way, right? And some can... can do that. That's mm -hmm. a part of the educational thing. It's to bring it to the awareness mm -hmm. of other people. Other people can't do that, nope. but other people can write letters. I've, mm -hmm. <laughs> I've had, I'm going to say probably a horrible sexist ageist thing, but I've had some little old ladies in my congregations that wrote monthly letters. Mm -hmm. And they kind of chose what their, their cause for the month was, and they wrote the letters to the legislators, either the city council or the state legislature or the federal government. Um, because they've educated themselves and they're doing what they can do. They can write letters. Uh, other people focus on what they do. They only buy organic goods. They only buy um, fair trade mm -hmm. products. Uh, we do what we can. 
But, and, when, and when we throw all those concerns yep. in and deal with them in our different ways, yep. we produce the pressure that eventually brings change. Right. We begin to transform the world around us. Yeah. And not just our little <clears throat> um, sphere of influence. It, 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 grows, it grows bigger than that um, because we have sisters and brothers in Christ all around the world. So we're yeah. all doing yeah. our part. Yeah. yeah. Well... Gosh, so I feel a little bit better about what I can do. And although I'm not always comfortable with the think, thinking about the fact that I participate in evil sometimes, but I recognize that we're human and that, um, that, yes, we're not always consistent. We do the best that we can. And we continue to work toward perfection. And um, so perfecting that love within us, the, the, you know, from God to, to the world. And I am so thankful for that. And I think as we end, can you um, can you share a, a prayer? And, and, and as, before you start sharing that prayer, I just want to remind everyone um, what we're doing during Lent is um, as we're beginning the prayer, we're closing our fist. And as we're praying, we're, we're releasing and opening to the Spirit of God. So so I'll, I'll, I'll close my fist while you, you okay. pray this out. This is uh, that wonderful Methodist idea of going on toward perfection, and baptism is a, a tool of perfection. Let us pray. Perfecting God, as we walk further into your light and your word manifests itself more deeply within us, may we come to understand that absence is not always enough. The absence of hate is good, but the presence of love perfects what is good. The absence of evil is good, but the presence of righteousness perfects what is good. The absence of violence is good, but the presence of peace perfects what is good. The absence of scarcity is good, but the presence of abundance perfects what is good. The absence of discrimination is good, but the presence of justice perfects what is good. Transform us as only you can, perfecting God. Mold us and make us after your will, while we are waiting, yielded and still. Amen. Amen. Well, Melvin, thank you for joining me today. And, and I know you're going to be back uh, during our Lenten series. And I will look forward to seeing you then. And next week, we're going to be talking more about the community of faith and how important we are as a church community in sharing light and good. So thank you for joining us, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.